Hey there, welcome to 16 Stops a Podcast. My name is Josh and I'm here with Brandon. What's up? And today in episode 11, we're going to talk all about red. Red. All right, Brandon. So first of all, welcome back to everybody. It's been probably a little bit longer than we were hoping, but we needed some time off to get some stuff sorted out. And we're back. We're back. We're pumped. We're going to talk a lot about red. We have a lot of stuff to catch up on as well, because mm-hmm. usually we do this podcast every week or two, but it's been like more than that. So yeah, about <laughs> six weeks, I think. As, as promised, we're back. We're here. We're going to do our best to be consistent with this, uh, but we're excited to talk about red today. Uh, there's also obviously been some big red news in the last few weeks, oh, yeah. and so there's a lot to talk about with that. So first of all, let's uh, give some personal news and updates and stuff like that. What'd uh, you one get, thing Josh? I, but before we do that, <laughs> <laughs> before we do that, uh, you went to Cine Gear, and I, I wanted to hear a little bit about that. So what was that like? I did. Went to Cine Gear. It's in L.A. What's really cool about Cine Gear, as opposed to NAB, rather than being in a closed off like convention city uh convention center city gear was outside on the paramount studios lot if i'm remembering correctly i'm pretty sure it's paramount not panavision p it starts with a p but everything was outside there was a nice breeze and it just had a much different vibe than nab if you remember nab had kind of like a businessman wear a suit type of feel It was still lots of fun because we connected with everybody. But Cinegear feels like more boots on the ground. The people that are actually making films and TV shows, those are the people that are kind of running Cinegear. So it's not as formal. It's not as stuffy. It's a lot more chill in its its feeling. And I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Met uh, Met some YouTubers. Ran into some new people. Got to hang out with Thomas K. I can never pronounce his name, so I'm sorry, Thomas. But then we got to saw, <laughs> got to see a lot of really cool products that are specifically made for like film and cinematography, as opposed to so much like software stuff that was like at NAB that I would never really use or isn't my forte. Yeah, so I feel like NAB. Obviously, that was my first time going, and I haven't been to Cine Gear, but it was a lot of like sport coats. Yeah, <laughs> like it was lots like, of sport it was like, coats. Lots of sport coats. So was this mostly like filmmakers and cinematographers? Were there like other YouTubers and content creators there too? Or is it kind of a a mix? Yeah, it's it's hard because there's so many people there. And I'm so new to this. And I'm very small in this, you know, YouTuber niche, like the camera space. Like I'm just personally pretty small. And so uh, there were YouTubers there. Like I got to hang out with Cam again, Cam Mackey. Such a great dude. Okay. So I had a great time at NAB, and, and now I know we talked that we'd like to go back next year. Oh, yeah. Do you think it would be worthwhile to go to Cine Gear as well? I do. Even though LA is like <clears throat> the armpit shit heap of like the Western United States, like it was an absolute nightmare trying to get downtown, and it's just sketchy as hell. That being said, okay. super fun. Like I met okay. Roger freaking Deacons. That, I saw the photo. It was that awesome. Blew my mind. Yeah, everything. Like when I posted, it, there were so many people that were like, "What the f?" So I mean, it, it was pretty cool. Had a had a really good time. Okay. Uh, before we get into like, uh, what did we buy? Uh, one thing I've been struggling with because now everyone wants to know, "What did you buy?" And it's yeah. always too much. Uh, I've been struggling with DaVinci Resolve versus Final Cut Pro lately, and I know you're a Final Cut user. I've been using Final Cut for the last year or two uh but what's interesting is i used to edit in resolve before i switched to final which is like most people are now switching to resolve which this could probably be a whole episode on its oh, own for sure but basically i came to a realization that i'm eventually will be in resolve but for right now most of my work is cutting up footage and editing stuff for my client work and for for youtube and stuff and it's just faster it, even like being fully in uh, resolve and being totally proficient with that, I think it's going to be faster. So for the time being, I'm sticking with Final Cut Pro. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Even though, even though I I know that the ha- the Resolve has a lot more fancy um, effects and depth to their color grading and a lot more power to it. For right now, I'm pretty good with it. So it can definitely be a little overwhelming. Da Vinci's, it is. And- da Vinci's kind of intimidating for sure. It is, and it's weird for me because I used to use it, and when I opened it back up, I was like, I have no idea what's going on. But I forced myself to get in there and, and cut up some footage and do some color grading and try to get used to it again, and I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. Uh, 
otherwise, in terms of the, my channel, uh, one thing that I just want to mention was the ZVE one, which because we talked about that pretty extensively on uh, on this channel for for rumors and stuff, and it came out. I got a chance to test it, and yeah, dude, it's a really interesting camera, <laughs> to say the least. Is interesting just... a a word you're using to cover up another word that you would like to use instead? maybe all right so <laughs> like firstly i got the camera i first of all big shout out to bnh because they've been lending me some gear to uh to help with my channel so i really appreciate that and um so they uh when i got the camera i'm like holding it i'm like this is an fx3 in a tiny body like i was i use that camera i know how powerful it is i was blown away and i was like man this would be super cool for like a gimbal something like that it's so tiny or vlogging like it's so so small yeah and then i started i went out and vlogged with it and used it and like it overheats so fast. Like really? it's, yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone's been like hiding that fact, but everyone's sort of reporting it differently. Um, and so in that video, it was like 28 minutes long, but um, you know, the numbers that I got, like when I hit record outside, it was like 75, 80 degrees outside. It ran for 27 minutes in 4K24. Now, can I ask you a question, Josh? Of course. R8 versus ZV-E1 when it comes to overheating, is there one that's better than the other? I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, the, neither of them are good, dude. Neither of them are like reliable long form cameras or cameras that I would trust out in the heat, especially when you start talking about 4K60. Um, it's not going to be a camera I could rely on. I was just like, oh man, this would be great for a real estate 4K60. It's tiny. No, 4K60, when I hit record outside, it ran for 15 minutes. And then it was done. It was done. Uh, anyways, it is what it is, but people need to, I'm just hoping that people realize that before they spend all their money and then get disappointed because it's, it's a hard camera to use. So anyways, do you want to get actually, on to, uh, yeah, I, I, I have something. Josh just hit 20 K on his, on his channel. So thank you, Brandon. <laughs> Small class. I can't believe I forgot to, I forgot for to Josh. mention that, but nice work, I appreciate buddy. that. Thank you. And it's crazy. And I've talked about this before in some of our earlier episodes about content creation that I feel like a small creator again, even though I have a larger channel, which I am not posting on anymore. But hitting 20K is a huge deal. Like yeah, it's, for sure. it's crazy. Uh, and in the camera space, I feel like that's not insignificant, even though it is kind of a small channel. So uh, thank you. Thanks to everyone for all the support, including you, Brandon, and all my buddies that have been kind of cheering me on the last year or two. All right, so let's get on to everyone's favorite uh, topic. What did we buy? What did uh, you buy? I will. I'll probably start here because you had the big purchase, which kind of leads us into the dis the discussion for today. Um, first of all, we ended the last season or series on episode ten, saying that I bought a C seventy, and I still have the C seventy. I you am, were like, I am mind blown right now. I thought for sure Josh's half life on a camera is usually about four weeks. Yeah, that's, that's, probably, that's probably about right. Probably three weeks. So I thought for sure the C70 would come in and then he would rotate it through with something else. But no, nope, so you're, keep, you're keeping this, huh? Well, we did our episode on favorite cameras and I listed it as my number one. And I just realized it's just such a solid camera for my studio. I mean, it's a solid camera anyways. It's overkill for what I do. Um, but anyways, yeah. So C70's here. I think it's good here to stay. Um, and you're shooting on it, it, I assume. Shooting on it right now. Yep. Very nice. Um, another thing I did was I sold my R6 Mark II, and uh, I picked up an R3, which Whoa, I've had that camera before. Boy. It is a big boy. It's it's also very expensive, so it's a luxury. I don't know about long term, but for right now, I picked it up as a B cam for the studio and also for doing my wildlife because it's my favorite wildlife camera. So, And I haven't been doing much of that lately, and I want to get back into that. So I will be selling my R8 eventually, too, to help pay for that. So, you know, it's funny, like, when we talk about this buying all this gear i'm always selling gear to pay for all this stuff i yeah. can't like just go out and buy them it's not like we're just accumulating because me like with my purchases i've been doing a lot of selling as well like i don't have yeah. fu money yeah so in addition to that i picked up a second zve 10 which i know was probably a weird purchase but i use them in the studio and if most of you've watched my videos i do like have multiple angles that i do and when i record youtube videos i just run all the cameras and then throw all the footage in Final Cut and do a multicam. So I don't do like separate B-roll. So now I have a dedicated camera for my overhead and for my low angle, and I don't have to move them. So ZV-10 is a great camera. It's got oversampled 4K. It does not overheat, which is crazy. It's only like 600 bucks if you buy one used. And 
Yeah, I mean, it's 8-bit and it's crop sensor, but whatever in the studio, it works fine. You should do a so, video on that little guy. I should. I did a comparison with the ZVE-10 with, I forget which, maybe the FX-30 and compare them, but yeah, it's a great little studio camera. And uh, for and I already have E-mount lenses, so it's great. Uh, and on topic of lenses, I picked up a few lenses. Uh, I'm now investing mainly in EF lenses, which I know is kind of a weird thing, but... They're universal. You can put yeah, them on any camera. Yeah, they're very cross-platform, so it's not like a, a bad way to go. Yeah, so you can use them on Sony with the MC11 adapter. You can use them on Canon, obviously. You can use them on RED. Um, so I, I've been picking up a few of the Sigma Art EF lenses. Obviously, I can't afford the um, <laughs> the cinema the lenses. Cine but versions. Ooh. I know. But their optics are great, and especially when you're using them on other cameras like you're putting a sigma ef lens on like a red or a sony you don't get those in camera corrections and so you have to rely on the actual optics of the lens and you can't get all those distortion corrections and stuff like that so that 28 millimeter whew, so good yeah i mean that's that's my studio lens i can't i keep trying other stuff and i'm like no i love it and then i've been dabbling with some contact zeiss lenses too which we'll talk about eventually i'm sure so anyways brandon so on to your big purchase which it sounded like i just bought a lot of stuff but really if we add up all that stuff <laughs> it's probably less than your one purchase oh man i mean maybe maybe not i don't know but i also i sold my c70 i know how you feel about that by the way immediate regret because it is such an easy camera that produces such a wonderful image. But that chunk back there is what we grabbed. So we, we just got the KX, the Komodo X. Congrats on that, by the way. Thank you. I am I am super pumped about it. It's been a lot of fun. It is everything that made the Komodo great and then some. So, so we're going to get into that in this episode. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about news and rumors. So we're not going to be able to cover everything, obviously, in the last five or six weeks. But we'll do our best to try to whip through some of these just to, to hit on them. First of all, YouTube lowered the requirements for monetization, which is so fascinating. So we're good. We're in. Uh, sort, sort of. Sort of. We're not so, necessarily in. Yeah, we're not not necessarily in. So we, I got the email that's like, we're eligible for monetization. But they lowered it from 1,000 subs to 500 but it's not full monetization. So you can get like channel memberships, super thanks, super chat, super stickers, and using the YouTube shopping features, but no AdSense. Basically, we got the participation trophy of YouTube is what you're telling me. It looks like there's some ways of making money, but not like the main way. So I I think this is great because they're lowering the entry, the bar to entry here, a barrier to entry. And I th it feels opposite from a lot of the other social media platforms that are like cutting back on or not increasing monetization stuff. So I'm a huge fan of YouTube, obviously, uh, both of both you and I feel very strongly about working in the platform. So um, it's really cool to see. But with that being said, we still need to hit a thousand subscribers. So please hit subscribe if you're not already. I'm, I'm begging <laughs> you, not from like a weird, I want to make money standpoint, but I just want an editor. And that's all we're going to use that money for is like, we can hire an editor. That way we can get more of these out faster. Yes. So agreed. that's all it is. So please subscribe so we can have an editor. That was been our goal. I think when we started, we were like, what happens if we get monetized? We're like, editor. Both of us editor, were like, editor. For sure. Editor. So um, anyways, uh, so other than that, um, good to see that. Uh, there's some obviously some camera releases. We said the Komodo X, which we'll talk about. Fuji the XS20 came out, which is cool to see them now working through their lineup as they do when they have a new sensor. Uh, XS20, what is it, fourteen hundred dollars somewhere around there? I, is it that much? Maybe thirteen. I don't remember. Wow, that's kind Either of a jump. I used to have the XS10. It was and, like a thousand then, right? Yeah, and it was a thousand, and I ended up giving that to my wife because she's she kind of started some YouTube with Whole30, and awesome freaking camera it's actually what i used to vlog on the nab and it was awesome it the only reason i don't use it for that purpose is the autofocus on that particular camera wasn't wasn't what i was hoping for but i've heard the xs20 is basically just like a smaller xh2s and if it's got the the same autofocus out of that camera or the xh2 yeah. or the xt5 like that's that's a marked upgrade so that's something yeah, to think so about. 
I just looked it up, $1,300. Uh, it has the same, uh, twenty. it has 26.1 megapixel backside illuminated sensor, but it's not stacked. Okay. So you don't get that XH2S sensor, which makes sense. That's why that camera is so expensive. But you still get 6K30, 4K60. You get 6K30 in that little XS20? I believe so. Yeah, I guess oh. it gives you that open gate 6K30 up to 6K30. I'll, so, maybe oh, that's the camera to go with. Jeez. Uh-huh. All right, all right. Decisions, so it, decisions. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool though. I think there's they're they're putting out cameras that got a lot of value for the money, and I'm also excited to see if them refinish refreshing their lineup. Like, are we gonna see the XE5? Will we see the X100 X100 Mark VI? Dude, I I I really think if they put a 40 megapixel sensor in the X100, they're gonna do quite well with that. Or Agreed. Fuji, if you ever watch this pull your heads out and make a GFX X100 style camera. Take your GFX like 50S sensor and throw it in a little X100V, no video, just photo, and you're going to just destroy everybody. All right, from your mouth to Fuji's ears. So hopefully that happens. All right, uh, so Z, the Nikon Z8, which we were talking about as it was being rumored, this is when we happens when we take so much time off with a lot of cameras. Uh, basically like a mini Z9, which I... I, I got to hold it and play with it. What'd you think? Uh, it is very small. It it really is just like a Z9 that they took and they stripped down and put a smaller battery in it. I think there was like two camps on that one it got announced was like, wait, you've had two years and all you did was make a miniature Z9? Like... You couldn't have given us anything new. And then the other camp is like, sweet, we got a cheaper Z9. Yeah. I, like My question is, like, did you want them to make it better than the Z9? Is that what you were hoping for? You were going to spend less but get a better camera? What is this, Sony I mean, now? <laughs> well, I mean, people want what they, you know, they're going to want the best possible camera. But yeah, it's also that's like, true. that's all you do, did in two years? Like, you didn't, like, it, improve anything, you know? So... All right. Well, it's cool. I think it's going to help a lot of people maybe still wanting to migrate from like there's their their 850s or, you know, like that sort of stuff or upgrade from their other their Z mount cameras. Uh, all right. So the Canon PowerShot V10 came out and I know we you're already laughing. Um, we had talked about it as a rumor being this cool. Like I saw that picture with the grip with the like. No, it's just like a it's like a playing card. It's like playing cards with like a uh, lens on it. So. I just disappoint on the video quality because from what I saw, it's like, just use your phone, you know? Really? It's pretty bad, huh? Uh, so Canon came out with another interesting lens release. Of course, we're still not getting the lenses that we want, but they came out with a RF 100-300 f2.8. So... <laughs> That's a monster. That's a monster it's like lens. 90, I think it's $9,500 and probably has limited uses, Brandon. Like, what what would you shoot with a 100-300? to Sports? Um, yeah, definitely sports. For like field sports, like soccer, football, that kind of stuff? For me, it would definitely be like a sideline sport. Football, baseball, yeah. maybe not baseball, football, soccer. I I would use the hell out of it for uh, volleyball. That's what okay. I would shoot with for sure. That would be a pretty incredible lens. I'm sure the image quality is incredible. It's also f2.8 all the way through, so great for sports, obviously, because you can crank up your shutter speed. Uh, and freeze the freeze the action. So, anyways, but we're still not getting our RF twenty four L, our RF thirty five L. You know, like so. I but yeah. speaking of who's speaking in of charge a company that, of that timeline over there? It's the monkeys. It's the Canon monkeys. Just spinning that. It's the spin the wheel. wheel. <laughs> What's up? Today? Imagine how much it costs. Imagine how much it costs to develop that lens. You know, it looks like it costs so much to develop that lens, though. You yeah. know what I mean? That's crazy. That's true. Uh, but speaking of companies that came up with the lens we were looking for, uh, Irix finally came out with something in the middle. Finally. I know you've been waiting for this. So they came out with their 65, and I know that you own some Irix lenses, so good to see it finally coming out, but it took a while. I have mixed feelings on Irix. I think they make awesome lenses. I'm not a huge fan of the company direction or the attitude when I talk to the company. This is just me. Yeah, they just they really just don't seem very excited about what they're doing. Interesting. I'm shooting on the Irix 21 right now. So if you like the look, if you want a really clinical, sharp, clean lens, you can't go wrong with Irix. Cool. And significantly less expensive than like the Sigma Cine lenses or something like that. 
Yeah, you're looking at like twelve hundred bucks per lens, thirteen hundred bucks compared to like five grand. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad to see them come up with something. Uh, I know you've been frustrated for a long time about that. So, um, <laughs> so I do want to talk about a few Sony rumors. Uh, one is the A6700, which uh, Sony Alpha Rumors has been pretty consistent with the rumors on that. So it's looking like it'll be an FX30 inside, but it'll be a hybrid body. So it'll be an upgrade to like the A6600. I bet a lot of people are excited for that one. Yeah, I'm sure it'll overheat because it won't have a fan. <laughs> Uh, so there's that, but even with the FX 30 innards, huh? I mean, it's got a six K sensor, so it's going to oversample, you know, we'll see. I mean, I could be, I hope I'm wrong. You know what I mean? But at the same time, it... yeah, we say all of this to be kind of like the, the negative Nancy's, but we want to be yes. proven wrong. Cause that's only a good thing. For Absolutely. Everybody. I'm sure it's going to have an EVF. It's going to be more photography focused or more hybrid focused, I should say. Um, but I was hoping for a new sensor, uh, for that. Cause they always use the same sensor for like a long time. So, uh, I don't know. That's, that's, what's rumored. There's also a rumor about a 7200 F4 G macro lens. So they have a 7200 F4, which has been out for maybe like 10 years or maybe more really great lens. A lot of people still use it and rely on it, but this will be smaller, lighter, and now have macro. So it'll be cool to see an upgrade for that. Wow. Interesting. Um, there's a bunch of other rumors floating around, but that's kind of what I've seen that's been fairly consistent. So hopefully we'll see that A6700. But with that, I hope we start seeing cheaper versions of the 6700 because Sony has not been coming out with inexpensive cameras. So I'd like to see some cheaper cameras. Roger. All right. So uh, Canon R5C firmware update, Brandon. A um, <laughs> uh, little bit of a disappointment. Yeah, I mean, they talked about this months ago and we got all excited about a couple of things. So first of all, there here's the list that I looked through. The, there's a lot of things on the list. Here are things I picked up. Let me know how these are. So autofocus improvements, power saving, the new Canon 709 picture profile, which I use in my C70 sometimes, uh, and then lots of other little stuff. So what were some of your thoughts on those after you installed it? So I think both of us were like, oh man, if this gets like a much, you know, improved battery life, that's a huge thing. Cause that's kind of like, I think the biggest pain point for a lot of people, it's like, if I want this to be small, I can't really keep it small. If I want to, you know, take advantage of the, the raw aspects, the 8k, like 60, um, we didn't get C log two, which is kind of a disappointment, but we thought maybe there was like a C log four coming for it. That didn't happen. Uh, there was also a autofocus improvement. Oh, I didn't, I didn't tell you whether or not it was good. So for power saving mode, and I sent you a picture of this, yeah. there's so many caveats yeah. to it. It's like you, you can't use power saving mode if you want to adjust the luminance to the screen. So if you want to make your screen brighter, like, well, you can't use power saving mode. If you want to shoot in any of the raw formats, you can't do that either. So you're really limited to just your basic, you know, uh, your basic codec, don't change the screen, don't change nothing, and then you get power saving mode. And uh, when I was using it yesterday, it boosted from 62 minutes to 78 minutes. So I got a, what is that, 16 minute improvement. Uh, however, was that in 24p? Yeah, that was just in 24p. Okay. However, when I use it, it doesn't feel much different. Obviously, I need to use it more because I updated it as soon as it came out. And I've used the camera twice since then. So it's not like I've done any extensive testing. But when me and you were texting, like I saw the battery drop like another two or three minutes. And I'm like, I don't know if this is really much of an improvement. And maybe there's no way to improve it, you know? It just seems, I mean, it's great to see them still improving the camera, right? They This is a camera that's been out for a while, and they're not ignoring it. We're still getting updates. But it kind of seems like there's not much left to do with this camera because I do think that if they wanted to increase the battery life, like, they would have done it when they launched the camera. Like, there's no reason to, like, do that if, if it wasn't actually a limitation in the camera. Yeah, I, it's, it's funny because it's like, yes, I believe that. But then also there was the R5 not getting, you know, like, waiting <laughs> two years to get an, a firmware update. I, we got to give like, we got to like tip the cap to Canon for doing updates. Like, I mean, the C70 Agreed. is a much better camera now than when it came out. And I would say the R5C is a better camera now than when it came out, but it's just marginally. And I feel right. like 
unless they could do some huge improvement. I mean, had they come out with a C log two on the R five C, now it's like it's like a different conversation altogether, I think. But because these things are are minor and it's even hard to notice that, you know, a power save mode battery update or an autofocus update, then you're kinda like, eh. Or at least that's how I feel anyway. Right. Well, you you did say that with the um, the Netflix update that there was more dynamic range. Yeah, so. C Log Three got a much needed highlight uh, dynamic range improvement. But yeah, it, I mean, I would still take C Log Two over that. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think that the C70 has gotten some seriously good upgrades. Like For the, sure. it got raw. Like that was a huge one. And I think the R5 overheating thing is complicated and as much as we've all been frustrated and complained about it for the last three years or whatever uh i think part of the reason they were limiting it was to not screw with the performance of the camera because i've heard from people that since they've raised the overheating limit that when the camera heats up it gets a lot noisier so i feel like some of it has to do with performance like i'd rather have the camera running at that point than not running but um, they might have been doing it to try to keep the noise down. I, as I'm definitely in the camp that's kind of like the Sony camp. It's like, just give it to us, and then, you know, we roll the dice. Agreed. We, we can figure out how to use our cameras and, uh, you know, learn the limitations. Okay, so uh, that was a lot to go through, and I'm sure we missed, like, half of what was what happened yeah, in the last month. But whatever. we'll get to it eventually. So let's get on to the main topic. Let's talk about red, Brandon. Um, yes. First of all, you are wearing a red T-shirt, so um, can I call you a red fanboy? Sure. Can I, can I start with that? Yeah, for sure. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. I'm definitely in the red camp, regardless of what you think of red. I don't really care. Okay. So I enjoy uh, Red's products. I think they're fascinating to me and very powerful. Um, and as most people know, like I'm extremely brand agnostic, so I like to try to use all the cameras. I do want to point out a couple things before we get into the discussion here. First of all. Pretty much all the work that Brandon and I do could be done on much cheaper cameras. And I, sure. I think that's so, something to acknowledge right off the bat because I think there's a lot of criticism that comes up when they go, oh, you're not on set. You're not making a movie. And like, yes, but like these cameras are cool and they're fun to use. And in our opinions, they give us a slightly better image in some situations. So we're going to we're going to roll with that. Uh so I just want to sort of say that beforehand. But anyways, let's talk about the KX, first of all, uh, because the Komodo X, we'll call that the KX. I think that's kind of the the street name for it. Um, so first of all, the release of this camera was absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, and I know to you because we talked about it extensively. But like when we talk about normal camera releases, we get uh, rumors for like weeks or months ahead of time. Then there's the announcement. And then you put in a pre-order and you wait like two months for the camera. Like what happened with this one, Brandon? It was totally different. It it really is, and it's it's because of the people at Red for sure, because they, they just run a different ship over there. They're a small company; they just do things differently. And I think it was what was it May? It was like the middle of May, I want to say, maybe the first of May. And Carlos was doing a live stream, and he was the live stream was on the KX before anything had come out. He was basically like, this is what I think the KX will have. And so he started going down the list of the potential specs. And then Jared Land, the co-owner and CEO of Red, was like, hey, I'll hop on a live stream with you. And whenever he does, I'm always like, oh, this ought to be good. Because <laughs> Jared is notorious for like, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for, Josh? Leaking? Yeah, he's notorious for like leaking stuff on accident and his people get mad at him. Is it out on accident though? I feel like that's their whole marketing strategy. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I feel like- Not their whole, but a good chunk of I it. I feel like some of it's on purpose and some of it is genuinely like- oh, I know, don't... he's excited. He wants to talk about yeah. it. Yeah, because he is. He, he gets so excited about these things. He's a big camera nerd himself. So that's one of the reasons why I like the company. But anyway- Carlos puts everything down and and Jared's comment in the live stream is like, what do you have a crystal ball? Basically like confirming all of the things that Carlos said. Then he ends up going on the live stream, confirming some things. And he's like, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll reconvene. He does another live stream with Scott Balcom. What up, Scott? Uh, confirms even more things. And at one point pulls the camera into view <laughs> And you can clearly see and everyone's like, screenshotting. Everyone's yeah, screenshotting. I'm like, what the? <laughs> so I screenshot, look back. Sure enough, it's the Komodo X in the Stormtrooper. And I, I tell Josh, I was like, dude, that was Stormtrooper. That means it's like ready to go in a few weeks. 
sure enough, it was like two days later, Jared in a Facebook user group leaked the price or just basically told somebody they were wrong on the price and then told them the price. And then the next day it dropped. And two days later, I had mine in hand. Just a yes. very weird timeline of how they do things there. Yeah, they, I remember they were, they were like, oh, the announcement will be like early next week. And everyone's like, okay, we'll get the pre-orders in. And when's the shipping? They're like, next week. And everyone's like, what? Like, there's no... And they kept it pretty quiet. I think a lot of people didn't know what was happening. So It really was. It was like totally off the radar. And then like two weeks later, you had a camera. Which is kind of funny because it's like, we're not going to say anything. And somehow we're still going to sell out of a $10,000 camera in a matter of two hours. So that's what blew my mind was, okay, so if most of you don't know, the Stormtroopers are the white models that they sell first. That's like the first batch they make is the white ones. And they sold out, I think, within an hour or two of the official like store opening up for sales. And what was amazing to me, Brandon, <laughs> was how many people were willing to buy a $10,000 camera that they only knew about like a week ahead of time. Like, that's amazing to me for so many reasons. And uh, yeah, they sold out super quickly. So the black ones are coming out soon or have they're already shipping? shipped? I've already seen. Okay. I've already seen some people posting like, oh, my my. KX is in. So very, as as we've already said, their marketing, their promotion, their pre-orders and delivery has been insanely fast. Uh, very different from the other camera companies. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm attracted to using their products and talking about them and, and all that sort of stuff is because their company is very different. And we'll talk a little bit later. There's a lot of people don't like Red for a bunch of reasons. So that's part of it. Um, and then nothing's perfect in this world. So let's first talk about the Komodo X because uh, I think... I just want to highlight some of the differences. Should I grab it? The Komodo. Sure, you can grab it. So as most of you know that we've talked about before, the Komodo came out in 2020 and was really designed as a crash camera to go alongside with much larger cameras. But then people started using it for ACAM work, for filmmaking, for videography, for all sorts of stuff. And I think there was a lot of things in the last few years that people have said, hey, if the Komodo did X, Y, and Z, we'd be really happy about it. And that's sort of what it seems like this camera became. Is that a good way to describe it? I think that's the perfect way to describe it. Again, you know, whether you like the, the, the company or not, they make stuff based on what their people are telling them they want. That's the, the whole reason, like, we have this. So, you know, people wanted better audio. Now this has, like, better preamps than the Raptor. I think it has better preamps than the C70. People wanted V-mount built in, so now it's built in. People wanted, you know, higher frame rates. This thing has, like, pretty crazy high, fast frame rates. People wanted CF Express Type-B. It now has CF Express Type-B. So, yeah, this camera came because a lot of people love the Komodo, sold it way more Komodos than any other camera they've ever sold. And a lot of people were like, hey, is there any way we can get an ACAM version of this? So they went and made it. All right. So you mentioned a couple of things. The audio was fascinating to me because I know that pretty much the audio in the Komodo is not super professional. But, uh, you know, you can add you can get it, uh, an adapter to plug in 3.5. You can also get an adapter that will take two XLR inputs, which is awesome. Uh, it's basically the same size, but just a little bit longer. Yes. So it's still very small, very compact. And if you're using, you have to use V-mounts with it, but if you were to use a V-mount on the Komodo, you would notice pretty quickly that it gets much longer anyways. So in yeah, some ways- Yeah, you got to throw on an adapter and then yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah, and media is huge. Now it's using CF, CF Express Type-B, which there are a lot of inexpensive options versus the CFast that's in the Komodo. So that's awesome. Um, you had mentioned higher frame rates. It does, what does it do, 6K 80 frames per second now? Yep. So 6K 80 in all of the uh, compression, so HQ through ELQ. Okay. Uh, and I don't know all of them. It does 5K 96. It does 4K 120 and 2K 240. Sounds like double but all the Komodo rates. It That's exactly what it is. So okay. it's kind of like the halfway point between Komodo and Raptor. So if okay. you were to take those and kind of squish them down into the middle, that's where you're at. Um, but there are widescreen versions that get even faster. So I think I think there was like 100 frames or maybe 120 frames per second widescreen at 5K. 
and there's more coming. I know they'll come out with an update that will improve that. Cool. So one thing that I thought was neat was the IO ports are now moved to the side of the camera versus on the yeah. bottom, which are way more accessible. Because I know getting that the SDI ports kind of a pain uh, with the Komodo. It's one of the reasons why I didn't like using the SDI besides the, you know, the tedious protocol, but it's just the placement where you were trying to put it down here and your fingers would get kind of stuck. Yep. Now I'm much more open to using it because it's right here on the side and it's, it's fast. There's no like, you know, cumbersome access. One thing they put on here, Josh, that was actually pretty rad is they put USB-C. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing the Komodo had as an accessory was the link adapter. It was super expensive. We'll talk about the red tax later. But it was like a $300, $400 accessory that would go over the, the pins, and you could plug in a USB-C and then hook that to your phone and then use that for basically zero latency monitoring. You can use your phone as a monitor. Now that that's built in, you don't have to buy that accessory, which is cool. And I've used it a few times, and it was flawless. So yeah, I'm, I'm, that was a really cool thing. So for me, like I, in my Komodo, I do have the uh, the outrigger handle. Which if mm -hmm. you use that, you can't use the link adapter. So you have yeah. to decide which one you want to use. So to me, that that's awesome. Um, uh, you know, and the other thing which I just want to say because I know like our buddy Tyler talked about was there's actually an issue where if you're using your phone to monitor through the USB. Um, obviously, you get low latency, but you have to have cell service if you're using an Apple phone, uh, you know, an iPhone. So that's yeah. a weird quirk that I didn't even know existed. I don't. I didn't either, and uh, I have not had that issue yet. Okay. So I, you know, I've talked to you about this. I was just at, in Vail for the GoPro Mountain Games, and the only monitor I used was my phone. And you're thinking Vail, small mountain town with thousands of people around you, like the lag or the connection is going to be horribly unreliable because on the Komodo, it's not that great. I mean, if you have impeccable internet, maybe it's a little bit better. We're using wireless I'd, or wired? Wireless the whole time. No, but this is, has to do with the wired connection, I'm saying. If you're using a wired yeah. connection, it needs internet. For sure. I'm just saying, I don't know what they did to the KX. But that that connection wired okay. or wireless is vastly better than on the regular Komodo. And I think that there's a lot of improvements have probably having to do with processor speed because as you've mentioned and other people, like the snappiness of the operating system on the screen is, is a lot better. It's a lot smoother. Yeah. Uh also the autofocus has slightly been improved from what you've told me and I've heard from other people. I, th I think it's much, much better for sure. Okay. Okay, and then there's another difference. We're getting a little bit more dynamic range too. So have you noticed mm -hmm. that or what other people have said about it? Yeah, uh, it's much cleaner in the shadows. Red advertised about a half a stop. Actually, while I was at Cinegear, I ran into Phil Holland and Phil Holland is kind of like you. He's a meticulous tester of things. Phil's amazing, by the way. And it was really cool to meet him because I've been watching him for a really long time. And uh, he told me that it was closer to a stop, if not more, wow. than a half a stop. So that was cool. Okay. Uh, also, there's a little bit of a color difference. Uh, you know, we still have the same size sensor. We still have global shutter, but the colors are a little bit different. Have you experienced that too? Uh, yes. It doesn't have as much of a push towards green. It's a little more magenta, and I've heard that was just to match it closer with the Raptor. Okay. Any other uh, differences? I... I... I try to think about them all, um, but as you've been They've using got, stuff. There's a couple. So cosmetically, we now have a record button on the front. Um, it's not on this side. I know a lot of people were like, why didn't you put it on this side? Uh, they have a electronic ND adapter that goes on here, and it would have interfered with that. So it's on this side. You can also see it's now got a locking RF mount, which is very yep. nice. Yep, that's cool. Uh, oh, this is a big one. On the Komodo... These pins right here where this handle is going through don't work for the monitor. They work for the outrig outrigger handle. They work for this top handle. But now you can plug in the Raptor monitor, the DSMC3. I think that's the acronym. DSMC3 uh, monitor. And it won't take an SDI. 
so just it's powered controlled off there so you can have like a completely wire wireless monitor solution which is nice all right so it sounds like those there are, are the big ones that i can think of josh yeah there's a lot of improvements as as we just listed through them i know some people like just saw one or two things and they didn't, were like wow i don't want another four thousand dollars for this but it, it makes it a much different camera for sure um, mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the accessories. I know you highlighted the electronic ND, or is it EVND or END? I forget what they call it. Uh, basically, it's a $3,500 accessory. <laughs> yeah. um, it's only PL, so PL to RF, but you can work the END with the buttons on the side of the unit through the camera and through the app. So, And it looks burly. It looks like a really professional solution. It's a hefty mount. I saw it and played with it in person when i went to cinegear before cinegear actually stopped at red's studios they were incredibly kind they answered all of my questions so i was very interested in this top handle and that's why i went but yeah i got to play with the end and that thing is is honestly pretty rad all right so i, I do want to highlight the cost of some of these things brandon so how much was the top handle top handle i want to say with tax was like 620 something okay the top handle is like 560 and then I love you, Red, but the amounts you charge for shipping is <laughs> just stupid at this point. But uh, yeah, so with shipping, handling tax, it was like six twenty four. Okay, some other accessories, like you mentioned, the DSMC three monitor we can now use with the Komodo X, but that's a twenty seven fifty, mm -hmm. if yeah. I recall. Yeah, two thousand lot, seven hundred and fifty dollars for a monitor that I've heard is not that great, and you can only use it on a red camera so right it's not a great buy for a lot of people okay what are some other things there's that io module that goes on the back that's new it's pretty big what does that thing yep. do so that one expands this so it gives you like gen lock and time code uh battery pass through i'm not super well versed because it's not something I think I would ever use. I would just buy the mutiny version of it. All right. I think that was all the new accessories. Uh, a lot of them were pretty pricey, like you'd expect, but we'll get onto that a little bit later. I want to next talk about sort of why I would buy a Komodo and then maybe why you'd buy a Komodo X and sort of have that discussion. So as we said earlier on at the beginning of the podcast that we could probably shoot all this stuff on much cheaper cameras. So like, why are we spending extra time and money and everything with red because it works very differently so i guess i'll start because i've i don't really talk much about the komodo especially on my channel i have owned one before and at the time was not the right camera for me and i decided to use that money for other things that i needed and i picked one up recently and i'm really happy that i did and i'm still trying to figure out where i want to use it because it's a very different kind of camera and that's what attracts me to using the komodo is that it's pretty much just a very different camera from anything else I've ever used. It's different than mirrorless cameras. It's different than Canon and Sony mirror, uh, cinema cameras. Um, it just operates differently. And for me personally, it's it pushes me as a videographer and filmmaker because, and as a content creator, like all the above, like when I use that camera, it makes me think differently about the process. And it just operates differently. Like, and the image, is actually raw so when you bring in your computer you don't have you can change the iso you can change the white balance non-destructively which is a luxury because when you go back to not shooting r3d you're like wait i have to i have to get it real close in camera otherwise i'm not going to be happy later uh and it's really forcing me to as i said slow down and think differently about things uh, and I really enjoy working with the image quality because it definitely has some special sauce. And I know, like I say that about some things, but the image just looks different than the other cameras that I've, that I've worked with before. And for someone like myself who does a lot of technical testing as well, this is a very technical camera and is, the color accuracy is really, really good. And so for me, it's intriguing from a technical perspective as well. So that's sort of like why I wanted to pick one up. I don't, I'm still trying to figure out where to fit it in my workflow and what to use it for though. That's kind of the problem for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's interesting because I think there's this uh, premonition. There's this uh, expectation that if you own a red, like you, you're supposed to be on set, you're supposed to be, you know, shooting some high level things. And I think that's, that makes sense all the way up until the Komodo. Because 
no YouTuber for the most part, you know, especially our size, we're not going to invest into like a $20,000 camera, you know, like a Gemini or something when we're not making huge, big budget things where we're going to make our money back. That wouldn't make any sense. But with the Komodo, it was like, wait a sec, I can get some of the special sauce for six grand. And it's not like that's affordable, but that's affordable for a red. And so I think for a lot of people, myself included, it was like, holy crap, this this camera that I've always wanted ever since I got into this anyway, you know, I can actually get it. And so I think a lot of people were like, whatever, dude, you can shoot this on this. And it's, yes, that's true. I can shoot it on an FX3 or I can shoot it on a, a Canon R8, most of the stuff that I do. But the process and the experience, I enjoy so much more on my Komodos. And so for me, that was my favorite camera. I used it on so many projects. I loved the look of it, loved the image, the texture. I loved having this teeny tiny body to travel with. Um, it had its limitations, but I loved using it. And then they're, you know, we, we had talked many times. I was like, if you give me an A camera version of a Komodo, I'm absolutely going to get it. And so now I have it. But there's also other things that I think. I don't think people realize how good of a studio camera the Komodo is. Being able to use this app, like right now I'm looking at the Red Control app on my iPad, and I could sit wherever I want. I could put it on a slider. I could put it in a weird angle. I could pull focus. I could do all of these things, and it just makes it a really useful camera. And the more I use it, the more I love it. And I know you mentioned this a lot about the tactile feel of a camera, how it makes you feel when you interact with it and use it. And I definitely feel that way about the Komodo. It's a camera, I know you say this all the time, Grant, because you've had this camera, you had the Komodo for a while now, and you go, every time I walk by, I just wanna like pick it up <laughs> and I wanna hold it, I wanna go shoot with it. And I definitely get that feeling with this camera and that doesn't happen with every camera and it's different for everybody, but it's a very fun camera to use because of the ergonomics, the way it feels, the way it makes you feel, the makes it make you, makes you wanna shoot with it. And I think that a lot of us get caught up in the specs and it does this, it has this thing, it has this feature, it has this limitation, but then we forget about like the experience of it. I know that's huge for you. The way a camera looks and the way it makes me feel, because if that's high, then I'm gonna pick that camera up way more than I would. I love the C70, but I didn't love it to the point of like, I wanna go put this in my bag and go shoot with it. It was just a tool, like a work tool. Whereas the Komodo, like you said, I will walk by it. I'll see it. I'm like, oh my God, I could just throw this in my peak design bag right now and run over to the skate park on my one wheel and shoot some dope looking thing. I haven't had almost any camera do that other than the Q2 and the Komodo. So I think for us, I mean, it comes, and I didn't buy this, a lot of the gear that I have bought in the last several years was like to make content about for my camera channel. I was like, I'm going to review this. I'm going to use it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to test it. I bought this camera to use it. I, I haven't really talked about this much on my channel. Um, I bought it to learn the system. And I think it's really important as someone using cameras, a filmmaker, videographer, content creator, wherever you fall on that spectrum, to use different camera systems. Because as you learn more camera systems, you will realize that the camera doesn't matter as much as you might've thought it did before. You start thinking more about framing, composition, lighting, uh, story, like all that stuff. And so for me personally, like getting to know Red has been really helpful for me. And uh, I think there's a lot of people that buy it because it's like a status thing. And the whole like, oh, is that a Red? Like what's what's the... <laughs> Guilty as charged. Okay. When I bought the Komodo, it was definitely, well, one, I, I love the idea of it. It's like, dude, you can get so much power out of this teeny tiny cube. But it was also this thing It was like, did I, I kind of, I kind of made it because I have a red yep. now. It was, it's like a multifaceted clout chasing thing. Like one, I have a red that makes me look cool. That's what I thought. But there are a lot of people that buy them thinking that they're going to get hired for stuff. Think that that's going to elevate their, you know, quality of work, like a whole bunch. And it's another tool for, you know, for us as, as creators. Okay. So let's, let's get on talking about why red working with reds, Red cameras are so different. Uh, I know I talked a little bit before about how it forces you to slow down, but a couple things for me that I've noticed going from mirrorless and you know the other cinema cameras is the boot up time is mm -hmm. significant. Um, yeah, you know, like even the C seventy, you flip it on within three or four seconds, you can be recording. Um, yeah. And so, 
the Komodo, you got to let it boot up and then you got to let it warm up and then you're supposed to black shade it. And then you have to do the SDI protocol. And then, you you know, all the things that you have yeah. to do uh, to get the camera running is just very different. And so it really, in my opinion, forces me to slow down or to use it in situations where I'm more deliberate with the way I'm using the camera. And mm -hmm. that in itself changes your approach to things. Uh, what are some of the other differences that make working with it different for you? Yeah, they they do some different exposure things, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think the, you know, they have the goalposts, and I actually prefer it over everything else. It's like 100%. I'm blowing highlights or not, and it's that easy. Uh, I don't have to hop into like a waveform or a histogram or false color, but they do have geoscope, which is another really cool feature. But I think the biggest one, the biggest learning curve for most people when they're jumping into red, or at least it was for me, I don't know about you, Josh, was this idea of no native ISO. You know, they don't have a, a native ISO. ISO doesn't affect things like it would on a normal camera. So you can change like your ISO and you won't see the histogram or sorry, the waveform change. Like nothing changes there. You're like, ah, I'm raising the ISO. Shouldn't this be brighter? And it's like, but it's raw. And so it doesn't affect it. You can just change it later. So that was a that was an interesting thing. That took a while to kind of get used to the sliding dynamic range that it has. Yeah. So for me, it that wasn't as hard because I basically train myself to just shoot at the base ISO all the time anyways. So in my brain, ISO isn't even a thing anyways. Like it just shoots mm -hmm. the way it shoots. And so I do love the traffic like goalpost thing or whatever it's called uh, because it's actually giving me the information off the sensor. Like I said before, I'm like really technical with the stuff. And so when you go to expose it, you'll see, okay, I'm not clipping highlights or shadows. The sensor's getting it. But then if you do change the ISO in the camera, you are then changing the way you're pushing the dynamic range. You're either to the highlights or the shadows, similar to the way like Cine EI works in the Sony cinema cameras, sort of. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing with this is you actually can see what the sensor's grabbing, not what yeah. you're exposing. So you can change a setting in there to change the waveform to be based on the ISO. So you can basically like see what the sensor's doing and shift the dynamic range and see how you're capturing the information all at the same time. And once you grasp that concept, it's like the camera just unlocks to another level that I couldn't do on other cameras. So that's been mm -hmm. really cool. I do love the exposure tools on there. What do you think of the uh, the file format structure? Oh, dude, for me, it's, a, it's crazy. That was the trip. That was it. Was like, wait a sec, where are the thumbnails? <laughs> yeah, it's not really the thumbnails for me, but it's like the file is a folder, so it's like all these folders. Yeah, it's it's an it's yeah. it's different. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but luckily in Final Cut Pro, you do get uh, raw control for for guys like yep. us, so you can go in there, and it's really cool when you go to grade because you can change the white balance and ISO non-destructively. So what I mean by that is you can change the white balance and it's not like you are going to crush the image. Like you're literally changing the white balance in the camera like you would if you were recording that way. Yeah. So and it makes me get lazy about going back to shoot on a non-red now because I'm like, oh, <laughs> right? I'll white balance, whatever. I'll just fix it later. There's so many times where I've grabbed a different camera. I'm like, God, Brandon, <laughs> it's so blue. What did you do? You, you forgot. You forgot to change the white balance. Uh, the other thing for me... Uh, and deciding whether to grab the Komodo or something else is autofocus because I know the autofocus is getting better and I think it's, you use it more than I do uh, on the Komodo. And for me personally, mm -hmm. I don't find it 100% reliable. So to me, this is a manual focus camera. And so yeah. that changes the way I have to work as well. Yeah, just as for kicks and giggles, like we were talking about this, I was like, I wonder how pissed off i would make people if i made like a <laughs> vlogging on a komodo x so i took it out the other day to vlog on it as just kind of like a facetious like troll video and you know it's so inconvenient because it's like okay now i gotta get my i gotta get my phone and use it as a monitor to make sure i'm in focus and you're holding this big bulky thing and it just made no sense so i don't so you scrap that better. video but yeah, I was like, this is, it took like an hour and I didn't get anything done because it was just like, this is so dumb. Clearly, the R5C is a far better option. But being behind the camera, I I will use both depending on the kind of lens, obviously. If I've got my 15 to 35 on there, I'm super confident with the KX's autofocus. However, if I'm on the Komodo or I'm using Cinema Glass, I use just the, the Cinema uh, manual focus. Yeah. 
so to me, it's been kind of a manual focus camera. Uh, other things for me is other than we talked about monitoring through the Komodo Link USB or the USB on the KX, it's an SDI camera. So that has other things for me personally that I have to deal with because my whole workflow in my studio, it's all HDMI based. So if I'm hooking up to a monitor, mm -hmm. live streaming, that's a whole other thing that I have to deal with as well. So it's only SDI yeah. and there's less monitor options and you have the SDI protocol and all that stuff. Um, yeah. what, what else am I forgetting, Brandon, in terms of like what's really different about the camera? I don't, I don't know, you know, cause I think, I think a lot of people, when I watch like YouTube videos and they start, they start talking about like a raw workflow and how different it is. I go, is it, is it that different? Is it so much different to like color grade and work with raw? Cause when I do it in final cut, that's everything I shoot on is like Komodo KX and it's super easy. That's the only other thing I could think of. That's okay. it. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, in terms of grading, I do have to start with a LUT to, to do the conversion, which I don't often do with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, compressed internal footage that I get out of like the C70 or the FX3 or whatever. At least uh, they have a really good conversion LUT. They do. Uh, it's a good place to start. Um, and also you realize that you're dealing with 16-bit video, which is way above anything else that's like out there right now in this price point. I mean, most of us are working with 10-bit footage. There's a couple cameras that might do 12 bit, but 16 bit gives you so mm -hmm. much color depth and information. I noticed it a lot with like skin tones and stuff like that. But anyways, yeah, there's it's it's a more complicated workflow I find on the end of using the camera. But I find that you have a lot more flexibility in post and it kind of makes your mm -hmm. life easier on the back end. That's kind of how I think yeah. about it. All right. So I want to talk about Stormtroopers for a minute because um, obviously you have the Stormtrooper KX. And I think in the past... Uh, Stormtroopers came out early and they were kind of known as like beta, <laughs> beta testers informally yeah. for the people that bought them. Uh, did you have the experience with the KX or do you think that's kind of different than it's been in the past? I think I think it is a little bit different and I think it's different for, I don't know, two reasons. The first reason being, I think this is their third Stormtrooper. So they had the Komodo, the Raptor. I guess technically they had the Raptor uh, super 35, but I think they were past that. And then this one. So I think they've just gotten better at it. Uh, I don't think we're in COVID times anymore. So manufacturing is much easier. Uh, so I didn't get that like delay and, a uh, super beta system. So there are, there are things on, on the KX that are beta E, if you want to call it that. Like when I first got the camera, it was a crapshoot as to what memory, media right. was going to be like working uh i had like the sandisk pro that's a pretty prominent brand put it in there camera didn't even recognize it took a super unknown third party uber cheap one and put it in there and it was like this media is not approved but i could record off of it so that was kind of interesting but i've had no issues Right, like a screen hasn't blacked out. I haven't needed any service or anything like that. I think the other thing that makes the Stormtrooper interesting, at least from the past, is that when you bought it, there was a pretty big delay between it and the black production model. Uh, so where you felt like I'm still a beta tester, you know, there's another six months before the black one, but the black one's already out. Uh, oh, that's the other thing. Also, cost. Like stormtroopers usually were more expensive than the black ones, but this year, for whatever reason, the stormtroopers and the black production models are the exact same price. Why do you so, think the price was higher originally? Was it like uh like coolness? Coolness, like a status extra... thing? It was like, yeah, yeah I, I, I got it in the first batch kind of thing. Yeah, I think so because I like I like the white, just that's me. Uh I know you're the one who the... bought the white M fifty. We already talked about this. Yeah. The powder coating on it is like, it's nice, but it's already dinged up, not dinged up, but it's marked up. Like there are black marks on there and I'm like, kind of like, ah, crap. But, uh, I, yeah, I don't know why they charged an extra grand because you are, you're paying an extra grand to be a beta tester. You're paying an extra grand to like be in the club that is going to run into software issues and, and problems. That seems crazy to me. So I, yeah, I, I just don't feel like that's the case with this camera anyway. And now it's the same price as the... So it's just like, hey, I got yeah. it in the first batch kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's talk about red versus the competition because this is always an interesting conversation, Brandon, because 
Good times. Here we go. I find Buckle that, up. and we talked about this when we did our cinema camera episode when we started talking yeah. about C70 versus FX6 versus Komodo. And the Komodo, yes, gets thrown into that conversation because of the price, but it's such a different camera. One thing I've noticed with Red and especially with Jared talking about the KX before release was they don't necessarily like pick a price and then make a camera. They mm -hmm. make the camera and then figure how much they're going to charge for it. Yeah. Uh, but with that being in mind, they did really build this camera to fill out their lineup, to go between the Komodo and the Super 35 Raptor. And so mm -hmm. the price dictates that as well. But as I said, it's hard to compare that. But when I think of the $10,000 cinema camera cost, I think about two cameras. I think about the Sony FX9, which mm -hmm. is a full frame, a little bit older now, um, $11,000 camera. And I also think about the Canon C500 Mark II, which is an $11,000 full frame, again, a little bit older um, cinema camera. Yeah. But but the, the KX is just a different kind of camera altogether. And so when you throw it in there, it's just, it's hard to like compare these things. So yeah. how do you, how do you feel like it lines up with or compares with some of the other stuff on the market right now? Or does it not? Uh, man, I just feel like I'm not very qualified to, to give a great answer for this question because I'm not, I don't think I'm the demographic that would normally buy this camera. Like I, I feel like I'm just in a weird space where I was very fortunate to have the money and I bought it and I don't do any set work for the most part. You know, I'm not doing a ton of jobs. I bought it purely because I freaking love it. And yeah. that's a weird spot to be in. And I think the people that would buy an FX9 or a C500 are those people. They're on set and they're working and they're like, why would I buy a Komodo? However, I think a lot of people are now looking at a KX as their, should I get into red for the first time? When I was with Thomas, I went, the whole reason I met up with him is because he's kind of interested in that camera. He's been thinking about a C500, but he wanted to test that. And he loved it. And he's like, crap, I don't know what to do now. I don't know if I want a, a C500 or, or a KX. So I'm sure there's some comparisons, but I think if you're a traditionalist or if you need more IO, you're probably going with the full frame, you know, FX9 or a C500. But if you're somebody that's more like me and you want like a really high production level A cam, but you can do some incredible run and gun action stuff, like KX is probably a better bet than those other cameras because it's so much smaller. Right. But you did make make a good point where there's a lot of people now thinking, hey, maybe the KX is a good place for me to jump into the Red ecosystem because now we do have things like audio. We do have some of the other things that we were looking for before in terms of IO. Yeah. So maybe they weren't considering the Komodo because it didn't have those things. It was too limited, right? It doesn't have NDs. It doesn't have, you know, all the things that people are used to, um, XLR yeah. inputs, like all the stuff people are used to with those other cameras. Do you think that people are now maybe more interested in the KX because their lineup is more complete as well? They see like, okay, I can get a KX for A camera, I can get a Komodo for B camera. And before there was such a big jump between Komodo and, and yeah. S35 Raptor. Yep. I think when there was that gap, a lot of people just saw like, hey, I couldn't like go all in on this system because there's not enough options. It was either a Raptor or a Komodo and there was too much disparity. Again... I'm kind of out of my depth here, so I'm only going to relay what I see from people that are, you know, on set a lot more. And from what I'm seeing, yes, people are going, well, now I could have like a really good AB camera, like if I went Raptor KX, or I could have a really good AB camera if I used a KX and a Komodo, you know? So you can get people that are shooting much bigger budget things and your lower budget corporate type of work, and they're that KX really fit that spot to where they're they're now considering and maybe they wouldn't have. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. I think they put out some interesting, I think it really filled out their line. I think that's also enticing for people if they're going to buy into an ecosystem that they know they have options for advanced, like if they want to upgrade to the Raptor or they want to grab a second camera that's cheaper or those sorts of things. I think that's really helpful. Um, all right. So there's also a lot of hate for red. So I would do want to talk about mm -hmm. this, Brandon. I know we've been fairly positive. <laughs> I wore my red shirt. I yeah. wore my red shirt. <laughs> so I did, we already been talking, I've already been hinting at the cost of the accessories and the absurdity with some of those costs. Uh, yeah. but some of the hate with red, uh, some of it's valid for sure. And Absolutely. some of it's, and some of it's a misunderstanding. So 
let's talk about the media issues that Red has come come across in the past or or set up for themselves. Yeah, I don't I don't know everything there is to know about Red's history, but I think most people know about um, Red Mags, which yep. were extremely expensive media, and I think there's one video in particular that kind of. I don't want to I don't know if the word exposed is the right word but essentially he's you know he was finding that these red mags aren't these crazy proprietary super fast you know uh SSDs or whatever that they were just run of the mill SSDs and people you know there people are being charged like 1400 bucks for it I think that's a big a big place to start when it comes to red hate and then also obviously the red raw like the codec you know people call red patent trolls all the time and so i think when it comes to the media the red mags probably justified when it comes to the patent troll thing i think that's completely unjustified okay so let's start with the the memory thing because yeah obviously that was in a lot of our opinions a mistake and they have since used off the shelf media and so you now mm -hmm. And that was a big, I think, upgrade for the KX that it uses CFB, which is even cheaper than yeah. CFast, which is what's in my Komodo. So awesome. it's awesome. Um, and I think that goes to show that they realize they made a mistake with that and they're listening to their customers and they're improving. So you can get mad at them for sure, especially if mm -hmm. that kept you out of the system or was limiting for your production, but it's changed and we're moving on from that. Now, the other thing is what we've talked about before with the red raw patent. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about this as well, because you can, other companies can license their patent and use that technology. And yeah. every manufacturer in technology license licenses patents and ideas from other companies for all sorts of products. So yeah. they are allowed to protect their intellectual property that they des they designed and developed and people just pay a licensing fee if they want to use it and that's okay like that they red has like i i heard the interview with jared and he was like yeah we yeah. use patents from we pay licensing fees fees to all other people to use in our cameras like it's just the way it works and he goes we're willing to work with anybody like if, if anyone wants to use our stuff we'll work it out and they have yeah. so i think there's a little bit of misunderstanding with that <laughs> yeah yeah so if I, I I hear people saying like red is, you know, essentially holding back the industry all the time. And I, and I just don't I don't agree with it, but everybody's got their own opinion. It would be interesting, like if, if there are other reasons you hate red, I would love to know down in the comments. Yeah, let us know, because uh, I mean, those are the sort of the main th things that I hear about in discussion. But um, I don't know. All right. So yeah. the other thing that. Uh, I struggle with with red of course we talked about earlier is the cost of accessories and i like to call this and a lot of people like to call this the red tax like the red tax when you're dealing with red cameras stuff is just expensive like there's no other way around it and so like yeah. okay you can buy the komodo for six thousand but you need to buy some batteries it doesn't come with a battery you have to buy the media like basically basic card for this camera 500 bucks for the most part yep for one card yeah. i need a different reader I want to get this outrigger handle, which I have on here. Four seventy four <laughs> seventy five. That was a pricey one. Yeah. Uh, I bought this used for way less. But I'm just saying this kind of stuff is very expensive, like we talked about with the the ND adapter, the top handle, the monitor. So there is that. And there's also the fact that you do need to rig these cameras up to use them in a lot of situations. So like I need another audio solution for this. If I was doing using this in a professional situation, I need to bring you know, like my Mix Pre 3 with me or some other yeah. external audio solution. Uh, I probably can't rely on the autofocus. Like I I need to use follow focus or have someone pull focus for me or whatever. Um, and so the red tax is real, man. Like it's, it's expensive to get into the system. Like, yeah, it kind of sucks. It's cost prohibitive, but it's the brand I really like. And so I just kind of like swallow it and pay it. But now, that being said, I haven't had any issues with anything I've ever bought from Red, cameras or accessories. Yeah, I have to say the quality is definitely is definitely good, but I feels it always feels like it's costs more than it should. I wonder also mm -hmm. the fact that like a lot of these camera companies like Canon and Sony, Fuji, like they also make lenses, right? So they're still making money on lenses as they well. things to offset the cost. Yeah, so I wonder if that's part of it too. But luckily now there mm -hmm. are more third-party manufacturers making accessories for Red. Like I have mm -hmm. a small rig cage on this, which small rig is pretty inexpensive and is 
yeah. you know, pre- I use their stuff in a lot of situations. Uh, there are a lot more third party accessories now for cameras like the Komodo and the KX. So that's helpful too. Yeah. If you were original DSMC or DSMC two, it was way more expensive for sure. Now it's, it's much, much cheaper if you want to go that way. Yeah. And probably from the fact that they sold so many Komodos out on the market that there's now a lot more opportunity for third party manufacturers to make accessories for them. Yeah. All right, Brandon, I think we covered a lot of stuff with Red. I'm sure we missed a few things, but definitely let us know down in the comments. We'd appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I am really interested to hear some of the comments on this thing because I'm pretty sure. Josh, which, what do you think are going to be the most common complaints we get about this episode? I'm just really curious if we didn't cover enough. We're too much of fanboys. I don't know, but we kind of like laid all that out ahead of time. Like you shouldn't bother with these cameras if you're just a YouTuber or whatever. So yeah, I think all okay. of the above. I'm sure there'll be some stuff that you'll want to, you know, entertain in the comments. <laughs> Can't wait to bite somebody in the comments. All Prove right. my superiority. Well, we appreciate all of you watching and or listening, and we'll be back real soon with another episode. So Thanks so much for tuning in. Peace.